All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the SETI Institute in another episode of Spacebook Live. And, you know, why be uh, organized and plan ahead when you can be impromptu? Sometimes impromptu is much more fun, and we've got a very special event today because we have, for those of you who follow us on a regular basis, we have a wonderful program called Laser SETI. And we've done Facebook Lives or Spacebook Live episodes about that in the past, and you've met the principal investigator on that, Elliot Gillum, and you're going to see him again today. Um, and this is a program where we are developing and have developed, as you'll see, a, an optical system to look at the sky 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all over the planet, and look for techno signatures in the form of laser pulse, pulses or short duration, um, high intensity, probably monochromatic light sources that would certainly be an indication of technology or life, intelligent life beyond Earth. So it's an incredible program, and we're here today and in this impromptu way because we are doing an update for our supporters and donors who've helped make this program come to life. And uh, so Elliot uh, came in today with the hardware, with the first um, ob observatory uh, hardware that we're actually going to be deploying. And uh, so we thought, hey, let's, uh, let's share the news and tell everybody out there in our Facebook audience what's going on and give an update. So Elliot, come on over. And Elliot's got the cool Laser SETI t-shirt on, and for a million dollar donation, you too can get a Laser SETI shirt. In fact, we'll sign it for a million dollars. We'll probably sign a lot of things, I guess. <laughs> anyway, good for to see you. <laughs> and thanks for coming in. So um, why don't you, uh, I mean, the last time I think we did a Facebook Live, where were we? I think we had like one of the camera housings and sort of walked through the basics of of it. Now you've got a complete assembly. Maybe you could tell people a little bit about uh, the assembly, about the project, and, and where we are, and what's next. Sure. Uh, there's a ton of things going on, a ton of work gotten done. Last time, people might remember that we had something that looked like this central thing in here. It wouldn't have had this motor-controlled shutter. Mm -hmm. It would just been the two cameras sitting side by side, as, as we had imagined. But now we've built a full observatory around it, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's more than just a couple of cameras. <laughs> Absolutely. So you can't really see under here is a PC that does all the data reduction from high-speed data from the cameras. There's a hard drive here for storing all that raw data mm -hmm. for as long as we can afford to store it. Yep. And it data is analyzed in real time, so we don't have to keep it. But in case we want to go back and so will this, So will that like store data in real time as we're also transmitting it? through a LAN for, for real-time analysis? Well, the, the real-time analysis happens on the, on the computer on right the computer. there. Okay. okay. So we can still go back to the footage for an instant replay for yep. some, you know, couple weeks, but then the hard drive will run out of space, so we'll just keep recycling, you know, that way. Mm -hmm. Then we have another computer up here, which, if this is the brains, this is kind of the nervous system and the muscles. Right. It's got a GPS for a super accurate clock. Uh, gyro and accelerometers to measure any vibration in the system because if you move the top of the camera by 100 microns then that's one pixel on the sky and mm -hmm. we that's don't like a human hair <laughs> and then uh, we have a camera so we can see what's happening inside and through the windows oh, okay. of the cover mm -hmm. uh, yeah so this is the outer cover because this is going to be outside in the environment so you've got to have it sheltered and protected yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, we made the decision that it was better to have it be more robust with these super high quality, basically fancy Pyrex windows, mm -hmm. super strong, super clear at all the wavelengths we're looking, um, rather than to have it open up every night and then potentially have to clean all the dust and stuff right. that might accumulate. Right. That since we want this to be a long duration, across the world project, we thought it was much easier to wipe a window than to have to Clean, clean optics. Size. And by the way, you mentioned the wavelength. So what is the wavelength range covered by these cameras? How, how broad are we looking in the optics? So it's a little bit broader than the human eye. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts at near infrared? or Yeah, so the camera has sensitivity from about 400 nanometers to about 1,000, whereas your human eye is more like 450 to 750. Okay. So, so that's blue to red. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although at the ends we have less sensitivity because that's just how CCDs robot. work. Sure. Our peak sensitivity is in the green, just like the human eye. Okay. So that would be like you know a lot of the green laser pointers or argon lasers. That's that, why they uh, seem so bright. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can see up front that's our power with distribution with fuses going to all the different components. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have LEDs and we didn't want to like drill out the LEDs and then not know if the hard drive was broken. Yeah. We just created these light baffles so that with the cover on, 
there's really no way for anything in here to bounce all the way around back into the camera. Right. Um, so explain the orientation of the camera. So you've got two cameras essentially at a fixed line of sight, uh, although the base is adjustable as you explained to me earlier. And how is it that each observatory is going to be looking at the whole sky? What's the setup idea? Well, a full observatory would be four of these looking in every 90 degrees, mm -hmm. which would cover the sky down to about 30, 30 degrees above the horizon, okay. with some overlap. Um, what we're going to do, instead of building, we have, we have funding for four of these. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take two and put them here in California yep. and have them looking out over the Pacific. And then we want to put two um, in Hawaii and have them looking out uh, back towards California mm -hmm. so that they look at the same part of the sky and if we have clouds at one site, <coughs> in that way we'll still be looking with the other site. Okay. And then most of the time we'll have two cameras, two, actually eight. Mm -hmm. uh, Separated four by? Four per, per, per field of view. A couple thousand so miles. If an event happens on the sky, mm -hmm. we'll be in a position to triangulate it. I think it's uh, three times the distance of the moon yeah. one is one pixel of, of our ability to triangulate. Okay. Um, and that way we'll have super high confidence in any events and we're much more likely to catch an event Right. Because, you know, for instance, right now in Northern California, it's cloudy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is strange but true. <laughs> uh, it's, good. it's good for the vegetation. It's good for the vegetation. And we really got lots was. of snowpack, I understand, like 200% in some places. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and the system has a, uh, an optical grating on it. So explain what the optical grating is doing and how that's helping us determine what we're looking at. Yeah, so that's right here, sitting right there in front of the lens, uh, with, this is the camera down here. So the grating is matched to the camera orientation and it, what it does is it takes a point source of light and spreads it out. Mm -hmm. um, and since a, a prism, people are familiar with, it breaks down creates the one rainbow. rainbow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a grating actually has many sets of, of reflections and so we, we've optimized these gratings to produce two spectra from every point source of light. Okay, and so it would, if you were looking at the actual image, you'd see each point source really spread out like a line. Yeah. And that would each, in the, the left and right ends of that line would be different wavelengths, essentially. Yeah, stars basically in Morse code look like dash, dot, dash. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And okay. then what that, what that allows, allows us to do is that the broad stuff, the dashes, mm -hmm. are not what we're looking for. Right. Yeah. And the dots are. Yeah. And so if we see dots that are far enough apart, not too far, the right mm -hmm. amount of where they should be, mm -hmm. then that means we got a, a monochromatic transmission at that wavelength according to the separation okay. at the point in the center of those two dots. Right, right. And we're also able to detect uh, very short duration pulses, right? If there was a really like a millisecond type pulse of, of laser light. Yeah, the cameras read out a little bit faster than, it's about 1.1 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. So we, we get a, a, a row of data out of the camera less, about every 900 microseconds. Yeah, yeah. And so that gives us a good time resolution. Mm -hmm. um, we want to observe whether it's the techno signature pulse that we think might be really short. Sure. Of course, it might be an hour long. We don't know. Yeah. Fortunately, yeah. this thing can actually do both because because we have this spectral resolution. We can take all the broadband sources and throw them away. Mm -hmm. We can now say, oh well, it showed up for ten minutes, but it did show up and disappear, and it stayed with the stars on the sky. Yeah. And so we can recognize a much wider range of signals because we're not relying purely on the duration. Okay. All right. Interesting. And so you know, you might ask if you if you haven't kind of studied this program before, so why look for laser pulses? Uh, I mean, this is a SETI program. It's very much like radio SETI, but instead of listening for radio waves, we're looking for optical signals. And why might we do that? Well, we send out optical signals, high-intense laser beams all the time. Our telescopes actually use them as part of the method for uh, doing alignment and focusing. They, um, so we're using high-energy lasers for that. They're used in telecommunications, free space lasers for communications. And if you've heard of this uh, program by the Breakthrough Foundation called Starshot, the idea is ultimately to build an array of very high-energy lasers to propel uh, tiny microchips with big mylar type of sails at near light speeds or fractional light speeds off to Alpha Centauri. And while that's a program that you know may be decades in development, the idea is using even lasers, uh, using photon pressure as a means of doing acceleration is you know, would, would be a very visible uh, uh, 
phenomena. If we took, in fact, up the road here, we have the Lawrence Livermore Labs with the world's highest energy, highest power laser. And if you took that laser and coupled its output into one of our existing eight meter telescopes, for example, on Earth and shined it out in the sky, it would outshine the sun by 10,000 times. So looking for laser pulses is, uh, you know, has a, a lot of merit to it. And this would be really the first SETI program of any kind in any wavelength that would really be all sky, all the time, which is, I think, the most exciting thing. Yeah, 20 years ago, we thought that was going to be the optical. Right. And right. just for a sense of scale, what Breakthrough Starshot is trying to do is send a one gram spacecraft yeah. to 20% of the speed of light. This system, as set up right now, could detect that launch from a, a maximum distance of 37 light years. Yeah. If you scale that up to a kilogram, mm -hmm. then it's 37,000 light years, yeah. and you could pick it up literally halfway across the galaxy. Yeah. That's and that's only one kilogram. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So this is very exciting. So what? Uh, where are we now in terms of getting the first observatory, or you know, getting getting eyes on the sky and uh, is starting to collect data and you know do some field testing of the system? Uh, so we've been running the system in the lab for two months. Mm -hmm. uh, we think we've got it all dialed in dashboard, thermal, air, everything is good there. Uh, we've got one more battery of tests to run, mm -hmm. and as long as nothing sig significant is found there that we can't quickly adapt to, then um, knock on wood, we'll be on, on the sky within uh, the end of the month. Probably. Yeah, yeah. well, that's very exciting. We'll, we'll certainly be looking for an update then. And uh, talk about some of the other locations that you're considering for putting the observatories in place. Well, it's... It's dependent on a number of factors. Sure. It's definitely a very fun and challenging aspect of the program because you you, you would, it would be easier to just have things looking straight up right. at lots of places around the Earth. Yes. But then you need that many more, you need an observatory per enclosure. Right. So right. Um, what we're, the plan I've designed has about 60 of these things spread in about a dozen different places around the world mm -hmm. where you generally need to be near oceans because we don't have land to look up over the oceans so and we have to look over those and the okay. Pacific is kind of big. Yeah. Um, but you also have to avoid light pollution. Yeah. But you also need power and somebody to make sure that the gear doesn't walk away while sure. sitting on the ground somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, so ideally it's something like California, Japan, Central Asia, um, someplace maybe uh, Eastern Mediterranean, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, maybe the Canaries is an, you know, there's already a bunch of observatories there. Right, right. Qualitatively, going to a place that's already an observatory it makes a lot of things great. A lot easier. Yeah. But then you have to set up the relationship with the observatory, mm -hmm. and if, if there's funding that needs to happen versus if we found another suitable site for a, of a private nature, then sure. that could be fine. Yeah. Uh, if somebody came in with a, a big check to, to deploy the system today, in their then, place, <laughs> then maybe we'd, we'd go. Well, we go you know, we've got way. people. Uh, coming in from, you know, Brazil, from Kurdistan, from Chile, from the UK. Great. So if you're out there and you have a location you think would be suitable for one of our observatories that meets some of the criteria Elliot mentioned of maybe being close to the ocean, dark sky, having access to power, etc., let us know. And if you want to fund it, even better. But, uh, and you were to talk about your trip uh, out to, uh, Bhutan, was it Bhutan, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. That was pretty amazing. I mean, it was... <laughs> Much more of a personal nature in that sure. we, we were looking around the, the country for possible sites. Yes. You were the guest. I mean, it was basically the king that had you and, and Pete Warden, I guess, and others yeah. as, as guests because uh, they're interested in building observatories and promoting science in the country. As, as a way to promote general interest in technology yes, and yeah. information technology, the way of the future. Yeah, fantastic. And, uh, yeah, it was an amazing experience. That's a really neat country, yeah. wonderful people. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's amazing. And it was yeah. quite a journey just to even get there, and, I guess. Yeah, and I've, I've never met a king before. Right. <laughs> and it's weird as this normal guy yeah. when you walk around and people realize that you're a guest of the king walking around in this country that reveres their yeah, king. Yeah, yeah. Who just instituted democracy, but they still revere this guy. And So you didn't have any problem with people buying your drinks? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. I've yeah. never met a king. I don't know. Lee, have you ever met a king? Plenty. Plenty, plenty. Well, Lee, you know, <laughs> yeah. he gets around. Five or six. Yeah, five or six. Anyway, that's very cool. Uh, so, uh, just quickly, so back to kind of locations. We've got uh, folks watching us from Buenos Aires and from Michigan, from New Brunswick in Canada, from Arizona, from Sacramento, Mobile, Alabama, uh, from Brazil, from Kurdistan, from Chile, from the UK, Lexington, Kentucky, Fresno, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Lancaster, England, 
uh, in looks like Conroe, Texas, and in France. We usually have somebody from Christian land in Norway. I don't know if, if you're on, let us know because you're usually there, so <laughs> say hello. We've got a question um, coming in here for you that says, have you tried to use the Apollo mission laser reflectors located on the moon? Uh, this is from somebody uh, from Trevor. That's an interesting question. I mean, you'd have to shine the laser at the moon and then see if you could see it with this, but that's a, it's a good question. Yeah, no, uh, we don't have a laser to shine out. We're looking, we're only the receive part sure. of that system. Yeah. If somebody were to shine a laser and try to bounce it off, then that could be interesting. I'd have to do the math, but I think if we got the timing right, a sufficiently powerful enough laser, yeah. certainly be more than a laser pointer, it'd probably be something the size of this desk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we got the timing and the pointing exactly right, that'd probably be the hardest thing. Well, if I understand correctly, the Apollo 11 mission, uh, one of the things that Neil Armstrong did was deploy a, a retro reflector. Mm -hmm. And the laser that they um, shined at it was at the Lick Observatory. I don't know if it's still there, but it means as well that the retro reflector is aligned with the Lick Observatory. Yes. And um, uh, that was actually the results of doing that enabled the first very precise Earth Moon distance measurements. And as a result of actually being able to shine a laser onto the moon and, and reflect back, uh, we were able to, for the first time, to actually verify what up till then had been just theoretical, and that is plate tectonics, the fact that the plates on the Earth's surface move. Interesting. That was the first time we were actually able to... We could have done it with GPS, but we didn't because... We didn't, we didn't have, have GPS at that there. time, yeah. <laughs> so this is 69, so... Well, the other problem with that would probably be that the moon is very bright. Yeah, so that's true. I, if, if the retro reflector were floating in space, mm -hmm. I, I'm confident we could do it with sure. the timing, yeah. but you put it on the moon, and that's the brightest object in the night sky, mm -hmm. and we might, might just be blinded saturate. by all the yeah. all the other <laughs> broadband well, reflections. Interesting, interesting question. So it's a good thought experiment yeah. to see maybe there's a way we could do it. Yeah. Maybe um, with a new moon, for example. Uh, then if the, I, I'd have to, into the mirrors. If at full moon, these things are going to be blinded, and I'm confident we're not going to pick up a laser. <laughs> okay. But maybe with a new moon. Maybe I'll, I'll run some numbers. Yeah, all right. Good can, idea. Can you put one on the dark side of the moon? <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I had previously thought we could just put them in space. Yeah. Just like Kepler and Tess. Sure. Um, the issue there is just you'd be building a different observatory to go around the cameras. Right, right. And you'd have station keeping and all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. again, it's kind of a question of if somebody funded the five million dollars to build the, the, the one on the earth mm -hmm. and they still had a you know a million dollars left over I'd say great let's put a couple in orbit and sure see what you know you you, you lose about one magnitude from uh, absorption in the earth's atmosphere right. so right. We, we everything is just brighter up there which just take you further out essentially yeah. in terms of sensitivity yeah yeah interesting idea well and as you know if you're a regular follower of space stuff and news China um, has landed um, hardware on the dark side of the moon. That was just a few months back, I guess. Um, so the Chinese uh, have landed on the dark side of the moon. And it would be interesting. And we talk about that. It would be a great place to put radio telescope as well as an optical setting instrument. So in any case, you're looking to, uh, to get deployed in about a month and collect some data. And we'll be in a nice position at that time to, uh, to do an update, show everybody. I don't know, Lee, well, if you can... Go ahead. That'll be when we turn on the cameras. Yeah, right. We, we have data from a camera on the sky. Uh -huh, so okay. That, that's how we decided to build the instrument in the first place, mm -hmm. is to make sure that it, everything looked the right idea in right. the first place. Yes. What's going to be really interesting is when we get both cameras simultaneously running for a long period of time mm -hmm. and start to match everything up mm -hmm. and see how do the statistics compare. Right. Because... The, because of the noise in the sky, the noise in the optics, and in the camera, there's little things that happen, yeah. and occasionally they can fool us, and that's why we have two cameras, is because... So it's really it's, part of the false positive yeah. uh, so mitigation. We, what we need is, is weeks or months of that data mm -hmm. in order to make sure that the false positives really are <coughs> happening, yeah. and start to see if there's real phenomena out there to be observed. Mm -hmm. We have some ideas of what we might see, yeah. but obviously with techno signatures we're extrapolating from a data set of zero, so... Who knows how long we'll have to run before we find that. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very interesting. And um, are the two cameras looking at the exact same field of view? Mm -hmm. They are, yeah. yeah. They just look at it, one reads out this way and one reads out this way. Also, oh, the, uh, the the gradings are, are orthogonal to yeah. each other. Okay. And the CCDs. And the C oh, and the CCDs, okay, interesting, interesting.
All right, Lee, maybe if you can come around back, I just want to show folks the back because I think this is kind of fun. You know, we're, we're normally, uh, and this, this weighs, I think the, the answer is about 200 pounds because of how, how solid and uh, uh, robust the stainless steel base is for this. And, it, you know, so it's very rigid, designed to, uh, you know, maintain a very still alignment. I guess here are the, the screw mounts you said that give the whole um, box, if you will, the ability for seven degree uh, incremental um, changes in, in elevation. And these are the exhaust pipes because we've got a big V8 engine in there. No, we really don't. But, <laughs> but this is a, it's pretty, pretty cool looking on the back end. And you did a lot of the design or, or pretty much all the design of, of these hardware elements which uh, were done with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. In some cases your own 3D printer, in other cases you had to farm it out yep. for different uh, material technologies, but yep. uh, all yep. of that is your, your own design work. Yeah, yeah, I, I code up the objects uh, the same way that actually my family writes code and, and they've done some 3D printing too. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the family that codes together stays together. That's well, there's the truth. So, yeah, yeah you, can, you can build you know, an object like this in an hour or two, yeah. you know, something more complex like this is a bunch of shapes. It's, it's often hard to see when you look at an object how it was made, Yes. but then it, once you start turning some stuff on and off in the computer, mm -hmm. then you see, oh, I get it, that's just that, and this is that. Right, right. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a very quick way to be able to say, great, I need something that holds it exactly like this. We did some cool sculpting up here so that we have airflow channels. We have a, a custom fan mount, mm -hmm. and the airflow channels take the air right where it needs to go. Right. So we right. get the maximum cooling efficiency rather than having to have a larger, more disturbing airflow. Well, what you've become involved in, um, you know, as a result of this project, is not only understanding, like, you know, an, a, an optical instrument, an electronic instrument, a digital you know, data instrument, but how you build things to be robust and autonomous in harsh environmental conditions. I mean, it's a whole different engineering problem, right? Yeah, yeah, this thing is designed to tolerate fairly, so I, we want it to be able to observe um, in windy conditions, mm -hmm. because if you go to an observatory, it's likely to be on a mountain, yes. and 50 mile an hour winds are far more common up there than they are sure, for most point. of us. Yeah. And so I wouldn't want to miss 10, 20% of our observing time, maybe even more, because we were shaking because of the high winds. Right. But you get to 100 mile an hour you know, winds and hailstorms and stuff like that, then that's more about, it doesn't happen very often, mm -hmm. and we just, have to, we just have to weather the storm. And make and sure then, it survives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I feel good about both of those things. Hurricane kind of stuff, yeah. I, I'm not sure whether, you know, I'm pretty sure you got a you know, three inch branch coming at this six millimeter Pyrex windows and you might actually do some damage. Right? Yeah. But I mean, you just water I mean, and, and snow, yeah. just rain and you know things like that. You've got to make sure it's waterproof and, mm -hmm. and it's one thing to just make something waterproof for a little while, but something that sits outside all the time and you've got delicate equipment inside, you know, waterproofing it is not trivial. Yeah, so. just, just this gasket here, this double layer gasket, yeah. was a good probably three weeks of trying different materials in order to because you can't just go to Home Depot and buy any old thing. It's right, like right. Crack or break or that sort of stuff. And so you have to find the right materials, mm -hmm. and you have to get them and try them, and then test them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're right. It's definitely uh, a lot going on here. Yeah. Well, just this fantastic. little orange piece is for this camera to be able to know where the shutter is, and we've got a computer ah, vision okay. algorithm yeah. that can tell where the shutter is, even mm -hmm. though from the camera's position, the shutter can be in, in lots of positions that are hard to tell from there. Yes. But by counting teeth with the computer vision algorithm, we know where the shutter is no matter what it's doing. Wow. Wow. And this this is just a contrast pattern. So there's, there's quite a lot of compute actually in the system as well. <laughs> there's a lot of hidden details. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, by the way, how, what's the data generation? How much data will this generate per unit time? So each camera is about 200 megabits of data. Mm -hmm. And so the PC processes that in real time, throws it to the disk sort of after it's thought about it, yeah. Um, and uh, but mostly the data that is reduced from that yeah. is almost infinitely smaller yeah. because most of the stuff is not an event we think we care about. So you're really so you're you're actually filtering processing data in real time. So you're only really storing yeah. phenomena that you think is interesting. That was the only way because otherwise the storage for that much data yeah. would dwarf the cost of the instrument. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. Well, I mean, you know, data collection and storage becomes a huge limiting problem more and more nowadays. Um, 
And the other question, I guess, that I think it, is interesting is, what is going to be done with the data? Will people out there, um, you know, citizen scientists and curious folks, be able to get access to the data and look at it and mess around with it and see what's there? Yeah. So, I think my first goal would be to just have some, you know, a website that explains the instrument and shows example data and some cool events and right. can can teach somebody about the instrument. Mm -hmm. Um, it's definitely very easy to put the raw data online, yeah. uh, some amount of it. Right. Obviously, right. we're not going to pay for hundreds of terabytes of raw data. Yeah. Um, if somebody <coughs> were to want to work with us and, and write code that, that maybe is a better detector or finds a different type okay. of signal or that mm -hmm. sort of stuff, then mm -hmm. that would be quite interesting and we'll, we'll have ways for people to work with us yeah. uh, once we get the system online. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think you'll have some takers. Any more uh, questions out there? No, we have a lot of suggestions for where to put the, the okay. camera, so I'll all share right. those with you later. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. So we're getting people saying, hey, I've got, I've got an idea of where to put a camera system, and uh, so we'll look forward to your suggestions. We'll get those compiled and in Elliot's hands so we can take a look at them. So uh, anyway, well, that's, that's the update for Laser SETI, and thank you for joining us and jumping on with this uh, little impromptu session. Hopefully, uh, hopefully more folks will get a chance to see this later on on our Facebook page. And Elliot, thanks again for, for bringing it in and for updating us and updating the folks out there. It's very cool, we're very excited, and we'll really be uh, looking forward to the next update after we've been on the sky with a, a dual camera system. Yeah. And thank you to everyone out there. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. I mean, some, you know, some of these folks, I don't know if any of you participated in, in the uh, Indiegogo campaign we had, to raise money initially for this project, but if you were uh, involved, thank you for your support. There'll be future opportunities because we're going to be uh, raising funds again once we've you know field tested and we're starting to build and deploy more systems. So if you didn't get a chance uh, earlier, there'll be other opportunities. But uh, again, so we got some more t-shirts. Uh, yeah, uh, there's more t-shirts, and like I said, a million dollars, I'll send you a t-shirt personally, <laughs> even for a much smaller amount. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us uh, from the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. Goodbye for now. Thanks again, Elliot, and we'll see you next time.